Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. The bottom line is, I have to seek God. Is this something that God wants me to do that will bring glory to Him? And finally, the last is this. By doing, going, having, or purchasing, could other brothers and sisters in Christ stumble, or would the lost look upon that and know that I'm a Christian, and they would then question my Christian belief system by doing that? So all of that, very simply stated, is not going to tell you whether you buy a pink car, blue car, yellow car, but the principles are much deeper than that. Is it growing us? And is God getting the glory? And am I able to take other people with me to God's glory by having, doing, going, being, all of those things? So again, when I'm unstable in my commitment to Christ on those principles, it's going to show in my emotions, it's going to show in my relationships, and it's going to show in my walk with the Lord that some days I'll be hot for God and other days I'll be not for God. And it's the choice that we can really make. Pilgrim's Progress talks about a man in there and he was called Mr. Facing Both Ways. I wonder how many Christians face the cross one day on Sunday and then they face the world on Monday. I, I don't know. I'm just asking you to, for a moment there, when you make a decision to make it simple, make it based on, is this really for God's glory or not? Well, that's the problem is indecision. But I want to get right to the solution because some of you are saying, yeah, I know that's the problem. I know that's the, that's the issue I'm dealing with, but what do I do to try to bring this about to make the right decision? There's just three practical steps. Here's number one. Admit your need. Admit the fact that, hey, I need God's wisdom on this thing. So what's the solution? Getting wisdom. I need to have God's mind on this. And God wants to speak to me through his book. So I have to admit that I have a need. Look at the verse. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, I chuckle at that. It's like, really? If any of you lack wisdom? I'd say, we all lack wisdom. We all need to have more wisdom. I need to have more wisdom. I'm going to use my two hands. One hand is going to represent knowledge, and the other hand is going to represent wisdom. Now, they're both in the same camp because truly you can't have wisdom without knowledge. But at one time, you can have knowledge, though, without wisdom. Knowledge is the acquiring of accurate truth or facts. That's knowledge. So you can even have accurate truth or facts about the Bible. You can accumulate a lot of knowledge. Having knowledge actually can work against us in the sense that the more we know, we could be prideful about what we know because now what we know, we can use it as a weapon. Or we could use it as a toy to play with, we manipulate other people, whatever. So knowledge can also work against us because it builds us up all, often because we have the knowledge. Now, the difference with wisdom, though, is wisdom is knowledge applied. So wisdom is knowledge with its working clothes on. And so it's a way to think from a biblical perspective. I was talking to a father who had an adult son, an adult single son, not in our church here, so I don't want you to think about anybody, but it was outside our church. And he was sharing with me about how his son is a good boy. His son doesn't get involved in the vices of the world. His son, at the same time, listens consistently to some of great Bible teachers, deep Bible teachers, accurate Bible teachers. And he listens to them as often as he's driving in his car, he has it on in his house, so he's getting his great knowledge. But yet the father hung his head and said, as nice as my boy is, my boy, though, is not reaching out and sharing the simple message of salvation at all with anyone, engaged with no one on the journey of faith, is not involved in any way the body of Christ on a Sunday. I do not know him to worship the Lord, but he has tremendous amount of knowledge. So I'm not putting down knowledge. What I am doing is putting up the importance of having wisdom. And we won't have that wisdom until we really ask God to reveal that truth to us for the purpose of, of applying it to our life. So we need to really admit that we really need it. The real question is, is what keeps us from getting that wisdom? And again, I think I talked about it. It's really pride. Listen to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. It says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. Here it is. But with humility, which is the absence of pride comes wisdom. So pride blocks wisdom. Now, listen for, for this for just a second. Whatever decision you're facing, what you might now do is instead of admitting to think that I can make that decision, I know what I need to do, I'm going to do it this way, this is the way we always been, I've been taught this way, and be, instead of being so quickly for just a moment, power down and admit, I really could make this decision, but wait a minute, would my decision be the decision God would have me to make? And so, Lord, for right now, I'm admitting, I really want to know what you want me to do. 
how you want me to make this, I don't care what it is, whether it's spending money or relationships or whatever, just quietly say, Lord, I need you right now. I'm admitting that I don't have the wisdom that I have. Now, the moment you do that, you're humbling yourself. And the moment you do that, you begin to open up God's floodgates of wisdom that you now will have the ability to make the decision. Watch this. Either quickly if it needs to be made quickly or it'll slow you down if it needs to be slowed down. And so whatever that is, the right decision we've made because for the first time now, you're, you're now saying, I don't know what to do. Now, here is the time, watch this, that you are the most susceptible to Satan. Because when you say, I'm facing something and I don't know what to do, now Satan is going to say, oh good, you don't know what to do, so I'm going to tell you what to do. And so we're now tempted to go to listen to the counselors or the advisors or our friends or our buddies that are out there to hear what they have to say. Now we don't come up to them and merely say, what should I do in this matter? But we begin to throw up a trial balloon. We, we put out a test case in front of them or we kind of remember, what will our friends think of us if we do this? And what will our family say if we don't do this, etc.? So all of a sudden we're allowing Satan to help us make our decisions instead of just quieting down before a God who loves us infinitely and totally and unconditionally. And he says, I have the plan for your life. I've got your future in my hands. I made you with purpose. And so he says, now just slow down. You're facing a dilemma. This dilemma is a road that you need to go. And I'm going to tell you what it is. And the Lord is smiling because you've admitted, probably for the first time in a long time, I need you slash your wisdom. So you need to admit. The second thing we need to do is to ask him for it. Okay, you're admitting. I don't know this. So it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Proverbs 2, 6 says, it is the Lord who gives wisdom. From him comes knowledge and understanding. So you do get that from him and how important that that is. So if any of you lacks wisdom. What you might want to do in the margin of your notes is to know this. That, that phrase that says, ask him for wisdom... 20 times in the New Testament, it says, ask, seek, and knock, and the whole concept of asking God. So over and over again, one writer after another writer says, when you're facing dilemma, keep going to the Lord. He is there. He is not going to rain on your parade. If anything, he's going to push the clouds aside so the sun can shine on your parade if you go his way. And so he says, ask of him. But also, it's in the continuous tense. So it's not just in a, I ask you and I leave it. It's I ask you, and Lord, I'm still seeking you, and every time I have to make a decision, I want to know what you have to have for me. Let me ask you this. What would you do if the Lord, this afternoon, visited you privately, wherever you might be, and he asked you this question? Ma'am, sir, son, daughter, if you could ask me one thing, what would be your greatest wish you could ever have? Now, some of you, you could play with that a little bit. Some of you would like to have another house. Your house is falling down. Some of you would like to have a car that's dependable. Some of you are lonely and you wish you had a mate. Some of you are childless and you wish you had a child. Some of you would like to put your kids in a special school and you don't have the money. And maybe that's your wish. I don't know what your wish was. But do you know that God did do that with a human being, a real live person, that God visited this person? And the only time in the Bible... But this only person one time, he then came to him and said, what would you like if you could have one wish? And that person is named Solomon. And Solomon was just given the entire rule of the Israeli nation, we might say. And if all the things he could have asked him for, powerful army, much wealth, influence in the world so that Israel would be stronger than its enemies, wisdom with his wives maybe, who knows. He didn't ask for that. Basically, he said this. I'm going to summarize it. I'm going to be a, a leader here. I'm going to be an influencer. And I'm going to be called upon to make many decisions, some little, most of them huge. Those decisions will affect many lives, will affect the history of our country. And really, I want to know what, what do you want me to do? What decisions should I make your way? I need to know what is your mind on my problems? If you were to make this decision, I want to make your decision. When I make this decision, I want people to see the hand of the supernatural. I, it's not about me. Lord, I want yours. Now, I'm summarizing that, but he really said it simply this way. Lord, I need wisdom, and I need your wisdom. He didn't ask for fame or money, power or health. He just simply said, I need your wisdom. 
And so I ask you now, would that be a question we should be asking the Lord? Lord, I need your mind. As if you are making this decision about this car, this relationship, this career, this job, my kids, my wife, my mate, my singleness, my doctors. Lord, I need your wisdom on this. How important that that would be. Well, there's also a third one here, and that's we need to anticipate it. I need to expect God to answer. The verse is really rich. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives it to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Take your pen now, if you will, and circle the phrase without doubting. You need to ask it, but without doubting. As I look at that, I think about as your pastor now, I wouldn't presume to try to lead you without God's wisdom because I know that I'm going to be preaching to you. I know that I'm going to be counseling some of you. I know that I'll be responding to your questions about life and whether I have to ask him 50 times a day or when Claire comes in and says, Pastor, there's so-and-so on the line for you. When I hear that, I have to immediately say, Lord, give me wisdom. When I go to my computer and I hit my send and receive button, if there's nothing in my box and it starts being overloaded with messages from you and other people that are asking questions, I cannot presume to immediately think that I have all the right answers. And perhaps I, I might know some answers if you ask a Bible question, but how does it fit you? You know, it takes mental work. I wasn't always this way, and I'm not always that way. But I'm more now than I was then, and I hope to be more in the future than I am now. But this is the road I'm choosing to walk down. Lord, help me. Give me wisdom. Our deacons that have to make a decision when we're faced with financial ways to invest the money in lives of others or keeping the facilities up, we desperately need to know, God, these are your people. How do we lead them? God, this is your facility. How do we keep it up? What do we do? Lord, you know the future. We don't. But we can't do it wringing our hands and thinking, oh, he's not going to answer. I hope he, oh, maybe he won't, maybe he will. I don't know. We'll just have to say. We have to anticipate it. Follow along with your pen for a moment. This is a neat passage. It says, let him ask of God. If you will, underline the word God there. Remember that when you ask for wisdom, you want to ask of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to counselors. The multitude of counselors are safety. But as long as the counselors or your counsel in your world will use God's word, then you're really asking of God. Humanly, you're going to the person, but you want him to give you God. So you're really asking God to use that person so you know God. So let him ask of God. Then it says, and literally, liberally rather, and without reproach, and it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith. So very simple here. We're to ask the right person. We're to ask the right way. We're to ask in faith, believing. So faith is a condition. I have to believe that God hears it. Sometimes when we ask God for something, that we want God to answer it right then, that we have a clear shout, a shout out from God on that. I would like that on some issues too. But sometimes what the Lord is saying, He says, no, you're not going to touch me, feel me, or hear me at that moment when you have a decision that you have to make. He says, because if I did that, then we would bypass or negate any need for faith. Just ask it, boom, it's right there, like instant coffee. He says, for me, faith is going to be stretched if you will trust me and allow me the time to answer that dilemma in the decision that you have to make. So yes, he says, I will give it to you, but faith is saying, let me take care of it. So let me go back to that list I gave you a few minutes ago when you're faced with a dilemma. Is this in God's will? Is it not in God's will? Is there a verse that will say you shouldn't do it? And is this going to bring glory to God? That list I already given to you. Now, that being said, after you're done with that and there is no clear conviction in your heart that any part of that would be wrong, at that particular time, don't worry about, did you get the wisdom? Didn't I get the wisdom? Did I get it? Or didn't I? Did. You believe then that you have that wisdom and you move ahead. If you don't have the faith to do it, then don't do it because then it's sin, Bible says. But if you have the faith, move ahead and then you could end it by saying this, Lord, I now see no reason why I cannot go, do, have, whatever. I've ran it through the grid of scripture and all the biblical principles. I know no reason to do this, Lord. I've asked you for wisdom. And so here's what I'm now going to do. I'm going to believe, watch this, that you will open a door to this that no man will close and I'm going to keep moving ahead until you choose to redirect it. At the same time, I also believe that you will close a door that no man should open because you know on the other side of that door is not a path but a cliff. And so I'm going to move and I'm going to let you open doors and close doors. Now I know Satan can do that, 
But Satan can't do that when we've run it through the other part of the grid of Scripture and we're walking by means of faith. And so that's when I'm going to trust the Lord. So when I believe that, it's not naming and claim it. It's going through the Scriptures, then trusting God and moving forward sensitively and seriously before the Lord. And I'm going to anticipate that he's going to do that. And he promises that. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So I need to do that. Number three, what's the promise? What does God do? Well, he gives it. The promise is he gives it. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it to all literally and liberally. All that you need and without reproach. I like the last part. It says, and it will be given him. That's the promise. How does he do that? Number one, he'll do it continually. As often as you ask him, he will continually give you wisdom. Constantly give you wisdom. Number two, he'll do it generously. However much wisdom you need, you're going to have all that you need. His resources of wisdom is unlimited because God is all wise. If he's all wise, then he can continue to give you all the wisdom you need now and for the rest of your life. And finally, without finding fault, when he gives it to you, he gives it cheerfully. He's not doing it to punish you. He's doing it to receive glory and honor and all the rest. And I hope that might be a blessing to you. I'd like to end with just a couple questions. First of all is this. What do you need wisdom on today? What are you facing this week that is huge, that will cost you time and, and money? What's a decision that when you make that decision, it will affect relationships? Whatever it might be, and then you take that message and you read God's Word. Not my message, but God's Word. And you pray that prayer, making sure that you cleaned your heart of any known sin so that now He can fill that heart with the fullness of God and His wisdom. And I want you to know that God is wanting you to have wisdom more than I can preach it, more than my ability to communicate it. He wants you to have that wisdom and He'll give it to you liberally. He's going to give it to you with great joy. It'll be the wisdom to do what God wants you to do. You'll be on the same page with the Lord, but you take whatever decision that you're making to do that. Now, there's a couple little side notes. God won't make the decision for you. You will be called upon to make that decision. Why is that? Even when the door is open, you still have to walk through it. And so why does he do that? Because it's a choice that you now are going to show, not to him, he knows what you're going to do, but to others, watch this, that you have chosen to walk the path of God's wisdom as a testimony. And so you have to make that decision. And then finally, the only true wisdom is going to be found in God's word. And so I pray that you stay in his book. You know his book because it'll help you in your decision-making process when you go through his book. Now, for the few that might be listening, you're probably wondering about the decisions that you're going to make, and every decision you make is important. I realize that, whether to have kids or where they should go to school, and you know, you know the drill. But let me tell you this. Some of you have the most important decision that you're going to make because it's going to involve eternity. And the decision is, where will you spend eternity? Heaven or to hell? And your decision is whether or not you're going to accept Christ by faith or try to find your own way to get to heaven and only find out that it's not going to get you there. And so your decision that God's calling upon you right now to make is that if you would place your faith in Christ. Now some of you have maybe even asked that. You humbled yourself and says, I don't know how to go to heaven. What do I really need to do to go to heaven? That may be the case. And so you know what the Lord did? He is answering your request right now through me sharing with you from God's word. So he's speaking to you when he says to you that you're a sinner. And because you've sinned by nature and choice, you're going to die separated from him and placed in a real place called hell. The penalty for sin is death. He's telling you that. That's wisdom. That's letting you know that you've got a consequence because of your sin. But he very quickly then says, don't lose hope. Going to heaven is not by your good deeds, so don't worry about not being good enough because it's not by your good deeds. And then he says that Jesus Christ died and he rose again. That's his wisdom. He says, I'm telling you that my son paid your ticket by his blood and death on the cross and his wisdom is now telling you because you humbled yourself and says, what do I do, need to do to go to heaven? I want wisdom. What do I need to do? Not just what I need to know, what I need to do. And now he's saying to believe in Jesus Christ, knowing that he died and rose again, that's the knowledge part that doesn't get you salvation. It just means you know it, but it doesn't mean you trusted him. And so now he says, here's the wisdom part. I'm telling you, you need to place your faith in Christ. He's opened the door of heaven. He's paid the ticket for you to get in. He says, all you now need to do is by faith, trust in Christ. Not walk an aisle or any of that stuff, but just trust in Christ. You have to come to him in your mind's eye and say, Lord, 
I know that you're my Savior, the one who died, rose again, and you're forgiving me of my sin, and I'm trusted in you. For God so loved the world. He gave His only Son that if you now not know that He's the Savior, but believe in Him as your Savior, won't perish, but have everlasting life. Now that's wisdom, and He's given that to you. That's your decision that you're facing. The most important decision of your life is where you're going to spend eternity. Humble yourself and say, where am I? I want to go to heaven. Now make the right choice and embrace the wisdom He's given to you. Make that right decision. He's revealed it. The Spirit of God is now reminding you to do that. Trust in Him right now. Once you do that, woo, woo, you've got the Lord inside of you. He's going to give you the ability to understand the Word so that when you face with these decisions, you have now the potential to make the right one. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes, shall we? Would you just take a moment right now and make sure, first of all, that you have settled your eternal destiny, that you have trusted Christ as your personal Savior right now. Can you remember a time, maybe not the day or the hour, but can you remember a time that you called upon the name of the Lord to be your Savior? Now, praying doesn't save you. It's a, really a mental transaction, but it was a time that you focused on the Lord, and it wasn't just knowing that He is the Savior, but it was a time that you were placing your faith in Christ. You were now telling Him in some measure that you're trusting in Him. You are thanking Him for His death and resurrection on the cross. You made it clear that it wasn't by your good deeds. It was only by faith in Christ. Do you remember a time like that? If not, then let it be today. Say, today is the day of my decision. I'm deciding today. I'm making the right decision today for my eternity. And let me tell you, once you make that decision and you trust Christ as Savior, you'll never have to make it again. You don't have to re-trust Him over and over again. When you sin, and you will, you don't have to re-trust Him as your Savior to get into heaven. That's already done. You're sealed. You're heaven-bound. You're His child. You're in His forever family. Now, the rest of our life as a Christian is made up of those decisions we make every day. We talked about that. And so the decisions that you're facing, would you run them through the grid of God's Word for the wisdom? So, what do you do? You admit you need His wisdom. Secondly, you ask Him and can keep on asking Him for it in faith, believing. And then you anticipate the answer. He will give you wisdom to make the right choice and then rest and rejoice in it. I'd like to pray for you. Is there anyone in here today that today you made the right decision and trusted Christ as your Savior and you'd like for me to pray for you? Is there anyone at all is there anyone in here today that would silently indicate to me that you're trusting Christ, you're choosing Christ, you're making the right decision to trust Christ? Okay. Christians, how many of you are facing a decision this week, and right now you're asking God for wisdom? And I'd like to pray for you, whoever you might be. Now, I'm not, I won't mention your name in my prayer, I won't describe anything, I'm just going to just generally pray for all the people making decisions this week that will be done wisely. But you'd like me to know that you are making a decision and you need his wisdom on it. And you'd like for me to pray for you as your pastor, your friend, your servant. Amen. Amen. Father, we all face decisions and we might live through whether we got cheese in our pizza or pepperoni or sausage. But Father, when we make a decision to end a marriage, that will affect our family's history forever. When we make a decision to step out on our mate, that will affect our family forever. When we make a decision to commit ourselves to love each other and to build each other up and to honor each other, that's wisdom in action. And that too will bless a family forever. Father, when we make a decision on how we spend our money or where we're going to give our money and how much we're going to give, that too will affect ourselves really forever with rewards in heaven or the lack thereof. We make a decision on whether or not we're going to be sold out for you. That actually could end our instability and emotions, relationships, and even our spiritual life because we've decided once and for all it is you and only you and we are hungry for you and we worship you, all of you, from all of us. Now, Father, I pray for these that are making decisions that they will enjoy the wisdom now that you will give to them because you give it liberally. 
in faith. Now, Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.